at our we're at our recording uh, portion of the section uh, of the session. Um, if you are, uh, if you would like to submit any questions, um, the chat is open. I'll be keeping an eye on that. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I would like to introduce our panelists. Patrick Salmon is the co-producer and co-director of Cured, the documentary we just uh, saw a bit of. A resident of Washington, DC, he previously served as creator and executive producer of Codebreaker, an award-winning drama documentary about the life and legacy of gay British codebreaker Alan Turing that reached more than 3 million viewers worldwide. Bennett Singer is a Los Angeles-based filmmaker and the other co-director of Cured. Bennett's previous credits include co-directing Electoral Dysfunction, an award-winning film on voting rights, and Brother Outsider, a documentary portrait of the gay civil rights activist Bayard Rustin that premiered at Sundance and won more than 20 international prizes, including the GLAAD Media Award. Bennett has also written or edited five books and is the former executive editor of Time Magazine's education program. Um, and I'm not sure if Reverend Kennedy is with us. Uh, she'll be here shortly, uh, Melissa. Excellent. Um, I'll go ahead and give her an introduction then. Uh, Reverend Magora Kennedy has been fighting for social justice for more than five decades, uh, an active participant in the civil rights movement, the women's movement, and the movement for LGBTQ equality. She is an original member of the Black Panther Party who describes herself as the gayest great-great-grandmother out of the closet you'll ever meet. A resident of New York City and a founding member of the National Action Network's LGBTQ Committee, she is a Stonewall veteran who is working on a book called Shades of Stonewall. All of you welcome. Um, and um, let's go ahead and get started. The first uh, question is for Patrick. Patrick, what was the catalyst for Cured? Why did you want to tell this story? And why now? Well, I appreciate the question. And uh, the roots of this documentary go back to the uh, fall of 2014. A friend of mine here in Washington is head of the present day Mattachine Society of Washington, DC. That's the group that Frank Kameny started in the early 60s to push for equal rights, uh, what was then known as the homophile movement. And uh, my friend restarted the Mattachine Society about 10 years ago to focus on recovering our lost and deleted LGBT history, particularly focusing on using freedom of information requests to see what various presidential administrations have done uh, in terms of targeting the LGBT community. So my friend through that process became interested in the life of John Fryer and, and Frank Kameny, of course. So my friend actually wrote a, a, I, I'm, he, he wrote a book uh, or a screenplay about Frank Kameny and he had me read it. And one of the scenes in that screenplay was the, the moment I'm, uh, that's behind me in the photo. You can see Frank in the middle of the screen. He was on the panel with John Fryer. I was familiar with this story, but there was something that jumped off the page of me as, as something that would make an incredible documentary. And so I embarked on that point first, uh, happy to see that there hadn't been a documentary made about it. Uh, this American Life had done a radio documentary in the early 2000s, but it's such a big story that there was more to do. So I recruited my friend and now colleague, Bennett Singer, to join me on what became a five-year odyssey between the fundraising and the research and tracking down people to interview. We started our first interview in the spring of 2015, and we released the film in the late summer of 2020. And, you know, early on, our, our priority was really to, to figure out who was still around, who had been involved in this in this fight. So that was really the, the main priority. And in fact, the first person we tracked down was Ron Gold, who was a fierce advocate, uh, so important in this fight. And I called Ron and he said, Patrick, I'm 86 and I don't feel well. So if you want to interview me, you better do it quickly. And so Ben and I spent about six hours in his living room interviewing him. And unfortunately about 
uh, six months later, uh, he passed away. And that was a very, uh, an early sort of uh, shock and reminder to us that, you know, time wasn't on our side. And so we really uh, were very urgent about interviewing as many people as we could. And, and thankfully, we're, you know, we're grateful for so many of the people who were able to uh, share their recollections. And they, I think, really are the heart of this story, being able to tell it in their firsthand recollections. And unfortunately, during the, the production of the film, which you'll see when you, uh, for those folks who were able to watch the entire 80 minute film at the end is the, uh, the, the where are they now screen. And unfortunately, six of the people we interviewed have passed away. And, and you know, with Ron Gold's early passing uh, early in the production, we felt a great burden to be able to tell this story in a way that did justice to the people who, who achieved this victory, because we realized you know, all of us stand on on their shoulders for courageously stepping forward at a point where it wasn't easy to do so. And we hope the film stands as a, as a testament to their to their sacrifice and their commitment and their bravery. Um, I I think an unspoken tragedy of of the film is that um, many of the people have passed away before their government gave them the right to marry the person that they love. Um, and their work was fruitful, but they never saw it ripen. Yeah, I think there's, uh, that's certainly, certainly the case. And, uh, there was, um, th thankfully though, some of them, I know Frank Kameny was able to meet President Obama in the Oval Office and receive an apology from the government, which was so, uh, symbolic, I mean, more than symbolism for him because he'd been fired by his own government in 1957. So, uh, you're, you're right, though, uh, Melissa, that not not all of these folks were able to see all that their work helped create. We have a question from the audience uh, from uh, Joseph Ebinger. Were there any stories or pieces of information that did not make the full film or the final cut that you can share with us? Uh, well, I could jump in and say Yes, I think we had 300 hours of material that boiled down to today's set of clips was 25 minutes. The PBS film is an hour and the f film festival version is 80 minutes, but you know, so many hard decisions along the way. Um, and in terms of some of the, the highlights or things that we really kind of agonized over, um, one th one amazing story that comes to mind is um, when we interviewed Kay Lahusen, who um, died last year um, in her 90s. But um, we did with her. We I'm happy to say we were able to show her the film and really get her feedback and her approval and her laughter at, at all the right moments. Um, but she tells this great story um, in the interview that didn't make it into the film about um reading this book called journey from lesbos about as the title suggests the process of escaping one's uh, same-sex attraction for women and she was such a renegade Kay, but she said you know she wasn't interested in taking her own journey from lesbos but she wanted to meet other women who like were, were kindred spirits and who were lesbians. So she made an, a, an appointment to see that psychiatrist who had written this book, Journey from Lesbos, went to his office in New York um, while she was working in Boston at the Christian Science Monitor, had a chat with him and said, you know, doctor, I, I read your book. I do, don't actually want to be cured of my lesbianism, but do you have any sense of how I can meet other women who are like me? And he to his credit, said, well, there's this group called Daughters of Belitis, and he pulled out their magazine, their newsletter, the, the um, latter, gave her a copy, and it was that process that led her to go to that picnic in Rhode Island that we do talk about in the film, where she then met her life partner, Barbara Giddings, but I think that backstory of choosing to see the psychiatrist, getting the, the uh, tip to, um, and, and that copy of the Daughters of Belitis newsletter, and then based on all of that, actually connecting with Barbara Giddings. Um, I think that's such a fantastic um, 
backstory, um, though, as you saw, it took me about five minutes to tell it. Um, and th that's the reason it didn't make it into the film. But speaking of Barbara Beginnings, there's also this fantastic um, account in, in a biography of her that before the wave of activism started, this would have been, I guess, 1968, um, certainly before 1970, but she actually snuck in undercover to one of the APA annual meetings, posing as a psychiatrist herself, and was sort of sleuthing out the scene to, to kind of get a sense of what was being said about homosexuality, what was the possibility for infiltrating the meetings, which of course the activists did do so successfully later, starting in, in 1970 after Stonewall. But I think that scene of her, her you know, being a detective really and, and infiltrating while undercover this meeting um, is another really interesting moment um, and such a such a testament, I think, to her spirit of, of really um, coming face to face with the people who would deny her humanity, and really um, being such a, such an optimistic person too. I think you know that's the other, another really fundamental point about all of us. She and Kamini and Kay and all of the activists, John Fryer included, had no sense or no, no, knowledge that their efforts would would win would succeed that they would win this fight and i think it's such a lesson to take away you know they they saw an injustice and they decided to stand up and raise their voices and and speak out whether or not they prevailed you know that testimony that sense of going on the record and 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 to you know making their voices heard was really what was driving them and i think the fact that they did win was huge, but just not inevitable. And wherever we could, we really wanted to build in that suspense, that sense of how is this going to turn out into the storytelling, into the into the film. Um, but those are a couple anecdotes among many that I think, you know, um, help uh, helped us understand who these storytellers and characters were, and certainly informed our structuring of the film, even though some of the specific details did not make it into the cut. Our question asker says, thank you for those stories and comments. So, and thank you. Um, sort of on the same theme, um, I'm a young queer person. And uh, especially when I was younger, I often lamented that we lost a generation of queer family who might have been my generation's mentors and guides um, to targeted peer and police brutality, mental institution, suicide, and the AIDS epidemic. And um, I'm wondering if you see this work as preserving and boosting the voices that might all otherwise have been lost to, to the noise, um, and whether you see this as also preserving your voice. Yeah, it's such. A, I'm sure Bennett has some some ideas. It's such a a great question, and it, it um, certainly you know one of the the difficult things with the the film in particular are the scenes that show the electroshock therapy and the lobotomies. And Bennett and I spent so much time on those. We, I mean, we spent a lot of time on the whole film, but we particularly there really got a lot of input from various people because we didn't lay out that scene in a way to shock people or traumatize people. We, but we felt it was our obligation to show everyone what it was like, what the stakes were. These, this mental illness label wasn't just words in a book. It had real life implications, not just in terms of the discrimination LGBT people faced because of it, but there was physical threat. There was people being admitted to mental institutions. And so we really felt like it would, we, we would be doing an injustice to the victims of this if we hadn't shown those really graphic and difficult scenes. One of the historians who advised us is at the Smithsonian Museum of American History and, and showed us a collection, speaking of something else that got uh, left on the cutting room floor, of some of the, the, the tools and equipment that were used to, to brutalize not just LGBT people, but but others in the history of psychiatry. And, and she estimated probably 5,000 people 
went through lobotomies who were who were gay and lesbian over the course of 30 years or so. And uh, of course, they're lost to history because it wasn't put in a, you know, their names, they didn't put it in a chart, or even if they did, the chart's gone and, and the privacy of protections and all that in terms of sharing medical uh, uh, records. But the bottom line is, you know, those, those people are lost to history. And so we hope this story can, can preserve that um, that suffering, if you will, and really be serve as as a as a um, really a motivation for us to continue the work that needs to be done in honor of those who didn't have the the, the fortune to be born when, when we were in terms of having a, 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 a society that isn't that is more accepting. Obviously, more work needs to be done. So I've always very much felt that this film is a is sort of a a, a memory to those who were who were let, who were brutalized by this classification. And I would add, you know, agreeing with all of that, um, we are happy to be partnering with this group um, with a fantastic name and mission called History Unerased. Their mission is to create history materials for K to twelve classrooms, uh, specifically about the LGBTQ past, and we are creating a version of the film and a curriculum for primarily high school history and social studies classes. Um, but I think that notion of unerasing history to the extent that one can, sometimes it's fragmentary, sometimes it's, it's not a full portrait, but I think this film is an example. There was no, there was no um, visual you know, full record of this story until we set out to piece it together. And I, I might argue to unerase the, the, the absence, or <laughs> that's a lot of double negatives, but to, to create something that would honor the survivors, but also speak to the absence of a full narrative. And um, I, I do think we were in some way unerasing, um, you know, that, that, um omission and creating something to take its place um and certainly the testimony of the the witnesses is is so central to that both the folks in the the archival footage um who went through these treatments that patrick is has was mentioning and also you know i think the opponents having having an understanding of what someone like dr charles Zaccarides espoused especially with his own gay son and the irony you know you're you you probably understand it more clearly than i do as a psychoanalyst in training or you know uh, and the folks on this call but as i understand it dr Socarides' basic theory was you know absent fathers were the culprits or the core cause of um deviant sons you know and and that that Father son Oedipal dynamic <laughs> as it played out between Dr. Socarides and his gay son Richard is is another piece of this history that we wanted to chronicle and I guess on a race or at least you know shine a spotlight on um and I it what I would say the hardest interview to secure was in fact the one with Richard Socarides he wasn't clamoring to do this and it took some persuading, but I certainly give him credit for, you know, to the extent that he did open up. And in some ways, I think he was quite guarded in his interview. And, and there were some topics that he didn't really open up fully on, I would say. But, but in those silences and in those gaps, there's also something very telling and revealing about his experience. And I think what came through was just this very complex relationship between a father and a son who, who weren't totally estranged but who who coexisted and and I think you know I, I just think that that dynamic um and Richard's growing up in that house and his telling his father who then takes a gun out of his psychiatrist's desk you can't do this to me you know this like that's an example where you can't really make up um you know, if we were scripting this, like people would not believe that sort of, um, you know, characterization. And yet I have every reason to believe that, it, you know, that Richard was 
was um, completely, you know, accurate in his recollection. So, um, and I, I see that Reverend Kennedy has happily joined us after some technical uh, challenges, but we're thrilled to have her with us. And um, I think she's connecting to audio, but um, happy that that we're all together now. Um, while we wait for her audio to come online, um, Bennett, can I ask um, about the production process? Um, Absolutely. The search for the archival materials and how long did it take to make the film? Sure, that could be <laughs> a long odyssey unto itself, but I will say it was a five year process. At the heart of it was the research process, the production process, finding storytellers who had you know lived this history and then finding visual material to support that we had two fantastic archival producers who spent years really um, collectively digging through uh, both sort of some of the traditional repositories of archival footage like cbs news and then some of the less traditional places like the historical society of pennsylvania where john fryer's papers are housed, um, 217 boxes, if I'm getting that right, of archival material. Patrick and I, before COVID, spent about a week there going through oh, his, okay. his journals and his papers and his photographs and found some fantastic material. Okay, there. says your microphone is unmuted. <laughs> Hi, Reverend Kennedy, we can hear oh. you. <laughs> she's she's uh, coming soon, I think, I hope. Um, but anyway, in terms of finishing up that piece of it, uh, at the Friar collection, we um, we not only found photos and journal entries, but also that tape recording of the 1972 speech on May 2nd of 1972, exactly 51 years ago, um, which was in this little shoebox labeled miscellaneous audio. And apparently even the Historical Society itself didn't re realize that they had this treasure in their archive because it was unlabeled. And we just sat, I sat there hour after hour listening to these cassettes. And it was such a miraculous discovery, as you can imagine, to have that audio, which nobody seemed to know was there. So what a gift and what a you know to again to this notion of unerasing what we thought was lost because people didn't know this recording existed but through that legwork you know and sometimes a lot of court of a lot of archival material is in fact digitized and available online but this was an example where it wasn't accessible through the website and you, we just had to or we benefited big time from being there in person and going through those those uh, cassettes. I'll also say in terms of our footage discoveries, there were some fantastic um, some fantastic discoveries that I think hadn't been seen by anyone in like 50 years. There's a segment from 60 Minutes about the civil war, as they called it, that was going on as this debate sort of, you know, was was being um, focused on within the world of psychiatry there was that panel you saw in the clip of the the lesbians on the David Susskind show and I think you know that was in fact how we first learned about Reverend Kennedy and it was because of that that we researched her and were able to um, find a, a contact number for her and then connect with her and then you know discover that um she had and there she is that her story was so her childhood her teenage years were so deeply affected by the dsm diagnosis and and that brutal process she went through of deciding between going to the mental institution and, and getting married but we're happy to see you reverend kennedy welcome and oh thank you <laughs> I, I i've had my own like, Zoom hallelujah. today. But it's <laughs> wonderful that you're here and um, i'm sure people will have questions and reactions so i will stop talking and our oh, moderator right. is with us <laughs> melissa cole who's um uh, am i right melissa you're a, a in the future uh or in training, attending the, the Psychoanalytic Institute? and Yes, I'm a, I'm an analyst in training. Um, I also have a private practice and I'm a oh, statistician. Wonderful. Oh. Welcome, welcome, Reverend Kennedy. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're so happy that you're here. Um, one of the then he say, I made it and muddled on through. <laughs> tech, tech issues and all. I hear it. Um, may I ask you a question, Reverend Kennedy? Certainly. certainly. So uh, Bennett just referenced it, but one of the most electrifying moments in the film came when you confronted David Susskind on national TV. Can yes. you take us back to that moment? What were you oh, feeling my goodness. and it, what it, led up to it? It like it happened yesterday, but what, anyway, we were all in the studio. Um, um, uh, Barbara Giddings was listed as Dr. Barbara Giddings. So I always called her Dr. Giddings, you know, but that's the way it was listed for the television show. So anyway, um, we're sitting waiting, you know, to go in studio and here come David Susskind, he's sauntering on by and he looks at us like, you know, like we're in the scum of the earth, you might as well say. So Barbara extended her hand out to David Susskind. When she did that, he looked her up and down, reluctantly shook her hand and then took a towel and wiped his hands. I was infuriated because, you know, Dr. Getty, she turned red in the face. And of course, he didn't even bother to speak to me because, you know, racism being what it was in those days ain't too much better today. But anyway, he just looked me up and down and kind of turned up his nose and walked into the studio. When he got there, I told her, I said, look, we're going to get him. I don't know how we're going to get him, but we're going to get him. So sure enough, we're in the studio and he's going on and on. How could a woman love another woman with all these men and what? And so then I couldn't take it anymore. And I reached across, the sister was sitting next to me and I was like, and my loudest preacher was, does that make you feel good? He jumped all his age and you heard the laughter because, you know, they went immediately to camera and um, uh, well, commercial, but you heard all the laughing in the background. He was fuddled. All his papers had fell on the floor. He's trying to gather up things and we're up there laughing our behinds off. We got him. <laughs> So when he came back, I said, I said, see, I told you we was going to get him. I didn't know how, but we got him. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Patrick, may I uh, send a question your way? Sure. As the film makes clear, the fight for LGBTQ plus equality continues today, combating discredited practices such as conversion therapy. How do the events depicted in the film connect to the establishment of these harmful practices? Well, they, they connect directly. Thank you for the question. It, you know, if you look at the roots of the, the so-called conversion therapy movement, what we know of today, it really started in the spring of 1974. And I think it was when uh, people like Socrates and Bieber and others who were trying to cure us realized that they were no longer going to be able to stand behind what was in the DSM. And so that was really the start of this uh, conversion therapy movement, uh, Love in Action, uh, eventually Exodus International. And, you know, over the years, it's become like whack-a-mole where, you know, organizations like Exodus will go out of business. But you know, these practices are still popping up, still happening all around the country. Uh, happy to say that 20 states have banned conversion therapy uh, for, for LGBT uh, minors, but it's, it's even in those states where it's banned, uh, many of the to, to, to change us happen in uh, faith communities where the, where the so-called the counseling has nothing to do with, with me a mental health rubric, but it's the same kind of devastating uh, effects in terms of the damage that conversion therapy causes to those who are forced to endure it. So I think, you know, we're, we've been um, humbled that we've been able to partner with some of the organizations uh, that are working to end conversion therapy, like the Trevor Project and Born Perfect using our film as part of their efforts to educate uh, people, uh, lawmakers and, and policymakers around the country about this history. Because the sad thing is that a lot of the rhetoric that was used by people like Socrates and Bieber in the documentary, it's the same kind of language used today by those who are trying to justify the use of, of conversion therapy. And I know in talking with the activists who are working on this 
issue today uh, at Born Perfect, at the Trevor Project, at other organizations. The heart of the case is obviously highlighting the science about the negative impacts, the devastating effects in terms of an increase in depression, a rise in uh, suicidality, and, and those kind of negative effects from enforcing LGBTQ people to, to undergo conversion therapy. But at the heart of their conversations with policymakers are the personal stories, the stories of, uh, of, of lived experience who people have endured and what that has done to them. So I think those two um, methods, if you will, can help continue to make, to make progress on this a difficult issue that, that unfortunately hasn't gone away in terms of the efforts to, quote, change us. Thank you for that. Um, this question from Lisa Toy um, follows, I think, on the heels of, of what you were just saying um, very closely. She asks, in light of the great achievements profiled in the film, how do the filmmakers view the new increasingly mainstream Republican view of queerness as something to be suppressed and in the case of transness, eradicated? Um, well, as one of the filmmakers, I can say, uh, you know, the battle continues. Um, I had an interesting conversation yesterday with this friend of mine who I would say is an activist. And I, I, I he had an optimistic view of this moment. He's, his take was, this is the last gasp. You know, same-sex marriage has become law. The movement has has really achieved revolutionary progress, and and we're at like the this close to culmination of that arc. And his view is, um, the the opponents are 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 desperate to to oppose that and and to challenge the rapid progress and and this burst of and surge of legislation represents sort of a desperate last attempt but it's you know in his i think optimistic view it's it's really kind of a, a you know a losing battle in terms of the opposition so that gave me something to think about it's certainly a surge you know i was just reading that 55 bills in 2023 alone have been passed targeting trans folks in 18 states. So that is not a fringe, that is really major. And, and it's, I think what's at stake are our lives and our existence and our ability to be open and visible and to maintain that progress and that revolutionary, you know, um, openness that we have achieved, including in schools, you know, that's a, when I think about my own experience as a high school kid in the 1980s, which wasn't that long ago, but there was such a wall of silence around anything queer, you know, certainly no out teachers, no GSAs, no support groups. It was this really brutal isolation for gay kids, LGBT kids. And I, and I think that has shifted radically, but when you look at an, a piece of legislation like the Don't Say Gay legislation, which was just expanded to cover not only students up to third grade, which was the original group and the original, you know, protection, protected group. Now it's covering up to 12th grade. So if you're having a, you know, you're reading a novel about by James Baldwin, you can't talk about who James Baldwin was or the characters in Giovanni's room. You can't talk about Bayard Rustin as this gay black hero and organizer and mentor to Martin Luther King. It's really, it's really devastating and, and serious. So I think my take is, as we saw in Cured, this is a moment for activism. It's a moment for allies to come together. We, you know, there's such a benefit, I think, to be, to be found in coming together and raising our voices collectively and thinking about the broader issues. And I, I do think, you know, we're talking about the ability to teach about racial justice and civil rights and black history. So there's such a natural alliance right there. And even more broadly, it's, it's about human rights and it's about the power of science and data and evidence to overcome prejudice and fear and bigotry as in the 
1973 version of this story. So there's a lot, but it's I, I do take away this sense of optimism from the victory that we saw was achieved against quite seemingly insurmountable odds 50 years ago and that sense of momentum that we and we we do have the medical community now fully on our side that's a huge shift the apa is now led by an out gay psychiatrist every med major medical organization is on record as saying conversion therapy is harmful and discredited and needs to end so so there has been again major shift but but the battle does continue and I imagine Patrick and Reverend Kennedy yeah. have to add to. I'll, I'll go <laughs> first and then hand, hand the baton. No, it's I was <laughs> unmuting to, to highlight to start with the highlight about the, the medical community today being on being on our side. But I, I totally uh, you know agree with what you were saying, Bennett. And I think hopefully our film can serve as inspiration to the activists, all of us working today. And to yes, it's 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 um uh, sad and infuriating to see the litany and the, the the legislation Bennett is talking about, particularly trans people being used as a political wedge issue. It's 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 despicable, and uh, so hopefully uh, this film and other stories from history that, unfortunately, our community's been through this before, and we need to to push back against it. And at the heart of that is is the personal stories. That's really the heart of our movement. The the of the progress that's been made is people sharing stories and particularly on this issue in terms of of trans uh, the trans community i think it is so, such a, a big role for allies i think you know as a, as a gay man i need to think about what can i do to to advocate and sometimes that can be as simple as engaging with friends and family who are not familiar with these issues uh, it can mean you know figuring out what each, what each of us can do to, to push back against the 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 onslaught of, of legislation reverend kennedy any thoughts um the thing that uh i i think i most <laughs> that i want to i just want to share this with everybody because personally i would love to see disney just pull up out of florida and bankrupt them <laughs> that's that's just my own personal thing but the thing is that nowadays young people they're not going to take what my generation took. I'm glad to see um, the uh, trans community coming together and fighting back because this is just the way it was in 1969 till everybody got sick and tired of being sick and tired and started fighting back. The thing is we have to come together and we have to work with our brothers, our, our trans brothers and sisters even in the sports field, I just got to having week uh, Monday night at the huddle, National Action Network Youth Huddle. They was talking about the fact that the transgender um, sister that wants to play with the women's basketball team is, is being fought every step of the way, but the team is behind her playing with them. Now, you can imagine years ago, this would not have happened, but I was glad to see that. I'm glad we discussed it. And I'm glad that um, this now, as this is coming about, people will understand that we are human. We have the right to exist, to live, to love, and be who we are. I think more so in this time, um, and this time of the struggle, the struggle continues. Yes, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And we have to gather together with our allies and all of those that are with us. And then if it means like, if it almost means like, well, I was going to, at one point I said knocking on doors, but no, after what happened to that young man, no, I'm going to knock on doors, but have forums like this and have the films available and talking to people whenever and wherever we can. Oh yes, there will be a change. May not be alive to see, may not be, I may not be here to see it, but I thoroughly, thoroughly believe, I'm optimistic enough to believe that my children, my great-grandchildren and my great-great-grandchildren will not have to live and go through um, this kind of thing. I think it is a last gasp and everybody is desperate to get their point across. And, uh, you know, like uh, getting rid of people like <laughs> Clarence Thomas and Marjorie Taylor Greene and getting them folks and DeSanto 
feels uh, like that. It's a last gasp, but I believe that we are on a victorious path. We will be victorious. We will win this. Thank you. Thank you for that. And hey, listen, I'm going to be 85 in September, and I thoroughly believe that we got to keep it going. You know, and you young folks, we started it. Us elders started it. You young folks got to carry it on. <laughs> Mission accepted. <laughs> and Dale, Dale and Christopher say, right on, Reverend Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the struggle continues. <laughs> so we we do have a few, just a couple of minutes left, but there are a few audience questions. Um, I'm going to check in with the panelists and see if you were okay to stay on just a little bit longer. Excellent. Sure. Um, so the first question is is from uh, Esther Swimwright. Your documentary focuses on psychiatry, the discipline behind the DSM. Uh, as a psychoanalyst, I'm curious why it took psychoanalysts until 1991 to make a clear change. Is there anything that you came across that addresses that, uh, that divide between the two disciplines? Well, I'd, I've done a bit of reading on that. It's such a good question. And my understanding in chatting with um, one of our advisors, Dr. Jack Drescher, who's a prominent gay psychiatrist was in 1991, what happened was there was this threat of an anti-discrimination lawsuit. And it was mm. that threat of legal action that resulted in the opening up of, of training for lesbian and gay psychoanalysts. Um, I think it was that legal um, threat. The lawsuit apparently didn't materialize, but the threat of the lawsuit was what persuaded the psychoanalysts at the time to open up their training to openly gay and lesbian doctors. And on a, the postscript to that was um, in 2019, the American Psychoanalytic Association officially and formally apologized for previously treating homosexuality as a mental disorder. So there was that official shift a couple of years ago, 2019, but a rather unprecedented one, or at least unusual for, um, for a, a, an institution in the medical world to officially apologize. But um, they, they did issue this very, I think, strong statement recognizing their role in causing discrimination and causing trauma. And part of that statement was saying, we are sorry, um, the president of the APSA a said so. Um, I think that ties into what we're saying about progress and took yes. a long time, but, but it's, it's, it means a lot, I think, and you all, again, as psychoanalysts can, can un help us, me understand it, but to have the psychoanalytic elders and institutions, you know, officially on record as, as apologizing for their previous views and for stating that homosexuality is indeed not a mental disorder, I think is, mm -hmm. is major. That, that apology, I personally, uh, is so important. Um, and um, yeah, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, from Tiger Latham, had Dr. Fryer been alive during the production of your documentary, what would you have wanted to ask him? Well, we've done about, what, 200 events and uh, Tiger, congrats for asking something we've never been asked. That's really good. <laughs> well yeah. done. Uh, and it was good it was in the chat because it gave me time to think about it. But it's, uh, you know, we um, we tried to get hold of an audio. Uh, I mean, we were thrilled to get the speech, where the recording of the speech, which we heard about. Uh, there, and I mentioned this, uh, Dr. Fryer died in 2003 and the year before, I mentioned that NPR had done a radio documentary and there was a long interview with him and we weren't able to get the full interview. So we just have clips from him in the in the a short clip from that interview. But I would be interested to know whether the people in Dallas knew him. Like, you know, when he when he showed up to the next panel, certainly I wonder if he was uh if it was noticed because you get a sense from the photos and some of the, the pictures in the film. He was a, a, you know, John was a big man. He was, he was tall and, uh, and big. And so he, 
I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how good the disguise was. I mean, it looks great, but I'm saying those who knew and worked with him, whether they would have known it was him. That's one question I would have for him. And the second one is what was his reaction when the uh, when the DSM was officially changed? One of the other things we looked through in Philadelphia at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in the collection of Friars papers were all these diary entries that he had made over 50 years. And we're, we in when you have a chance to watch the 80 minute film, you'll see one of those entries on the day after his speech, which is so compelling and moving. But we couldn't find an entry related to the events right in December of 73 and April of 74. And so I've wondered, surely he must have taken some pride in it. And I wish he would have written something in the diary. So I think yeah. that would be that would definitely be a question I have for him. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This question is from Angela Sandone Barr. What is Reverend Kennedy's retrospective of the changes she, she has seen in her lifetime in regards to being gay and being black? 360 degree turn. <laughs> um, over the years, and one of the things, um, I have this book on Amazon. It doesn't really relate to gayness, but the, I put on there, I was like this uh, salmon swimming upstream. And 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 so and doing and and so doing that, it was like okay. Once that I was like totally out of the closet, there was like no going back and no turning around. Um, it was like I always had, and like a couple of times when we were marching, I would say forward ever, backwards never. So that's the way I felt then, and this is the way I feel today. Forward ever backwards never and I'm so glad to see the acceptance and one thing I'm going to throw in here um because I, I was surprised by it but um the United States of America religious archives created an LGBTQ section and in so doing they named uh Reverend Troy D. Perry who started Metropolitan Community Church they named the late Archbishop uh, Carl Bean, who started uh, Unity Fellowship Churches, and now I am the living <laughs> example in this archive as a Stonewall veteran and also as a minister. So that was, I mean, that was surprising and it was humbling, you know, but I, however, I really feel that so much has changed. And, you know, as uh, different churches are kind of open to gay people, we still do have metropolitan community churches. We still have unity fellowship churches uh, uh, in the United States and around the world. So, you know, we've come a long way. We still have a long way to go. But I think tolerance is one of the things that's happening, you know, and recognizing that, um, the fact that uh, homosexuality is no longer declared a, a mental illness or a disease, and it's giving people a chance to really see what uh, gay people look like, you know. Um, I had, I, in fact, I had this one lady say to me, well, you don't look like you're gay. I said, well, what does gay look like to you? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> so, yeah. And one of the things like I always uh, get to people to understand that as far, unfortunately, when you look at the quote unquote Bible, especially King James version of the Bible, you know, a lot of the hatred and a lot of the things to, uh, uh, does it towards slavery and does it toward homosexuality. This all came out of the Bible. Like, for instance, the science shows that Sodom and Gomorrah was not destroyed because of homosexuality, but it was destroyed because of a volcanic eruption, you know? And um, uh, to another point, there's the story of Naomi and Ruth. That's a love story. There's the story of David and Jonathan. That's a love story. So, you know, I always tell the people, tell people, you know, people have selective uh, memory or selective scripture that they want to use. However, the Bible is a statement of truth that's not always truly stated. So when people look at those, uh, when they look at those particular things, then they want to get selective memory. My answer is God is love and love is for everyone. 
gay, straight, white, black, blue, or green. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Go right there. <laughs> One last question for all of you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, what do you hope we as viewers will take away from this film? Well, I'll, I'll chime in first and thank you for the, for the great discussion and all the wonderful questions. You know, uh, Bennett and Reverend Kennedy are probably tired of hearing me say this, but one of the, one of the themes that I really <laughs> um, find meaningful in the film is, is the interplay of insiders and outsiders. Mm -hmm. That you had people storming into APA conferences and taking over microphones but you also had people maneuvering behind the scenes to figure out the bureaucracy of the APA, figuring out what it would take to get the classification change. And mm -hmm. if you look, look at the history of our movement and the history of most social change movements, there's been that interplay where you need both. In this fight, it wasn't enough to have people storming the microphones if you didn't know how to translate that energy into changing the the, the classification. Similarly, without that outside pressure, it wouldn't have been enough just to have people maneuvering from inside the organization. And so in thinking about the work that still needs to be done, in talking about earlier the, the attack on the trans community in particular, or, or, or fighting back against the don't say gay bill, I think remembering that equation where you need outside pressure, but you also need inside, um, I guess, activism for back of, lack of a better word, strategic decisions about how you actually go about changing laws and policies. And I can jump in and we'll give Reverend Kennedy the last word. But for me, one of the lessons and one of my favorite scenes in the film is, is, is about dialogue and listening. I think that process of, you know, what makes a good ally, maybe my top answer would be like sometimes be taking the time to listen and 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 not impose one's preconceived views on a situation and there was that scene that that invasion of that meeting of therapists where the activists shut down the meeting or interrupted the meeting but then they said we want to we want to talk to you we want to break down into small groups and have a dialogue and and talk to you and that's for so many of those therapists it was the very first time that they had actually ever talked to gay people and lesbian mm -hmm. people who did not want to be cured but were completely well adjusted and happy and and uh willing to talk about that you know which was a radical thing in like 1970 so i think you know that that process of opening one's mind and and listening and becoming an ally through that method um and sometimes it's it's even against you know your self-interest in the case of psychiatrists who changed their view on this question in the early 70s they were if they you know if they had been treating gay people and trying to cure them and then walking away from that and saying we were wrong they were you know sacrificing um a lot of income you know and that that willingness to think about the social justice aspects of an issue, even if it harms one's own self-interest, I think is also a big takeaway from the story, what it takes to change one's view, to open your mind, to become an ally and to, to really, uh, to listen. So that, that's one, I think, fundamental takeaway for me. And uh, one of the things that I have like, um, I've been blowing, <laughs> like I've been blowing my horn, but I've been blowing a horn for uh, Patrick and, and Bennett also. I mean, do you imagine how it can feel? And I've, I've said this to people so many times at um, 83 years of age, the Cure documentary was nominated for an Emmy. And I'm like, oh my God, that was a humbling experience, but hey, it, 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 it's a rope. Um, I'd say it's an inroad into how people are thinking, how people feel, and uh, how far we have come. Yes, we have a long way to go, but the fact that we got Emmy nominated, I think, is something that we as a team should be so very, very happy about because it's an inroad. Um, I've shared this little bit with you in National Action Network convention um, that just uh, came off. Uh, we had 8,000 people at that convention. 
out of that 8,000 people, I ran into at least 10 or 20 people who had seen the Cure documentary. And I told them we got nominated for an Emmy. So, you know, it was like, yay. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm, I'm happy about that because what that means is we've made inroads. We can talk to people. People can see us. They know that we are human. And parents don't need to think that they've done something wrong or something's wrong with their kids because the kids is all of a sudden identifying with who they are. They're non-binary. They're not going to be put into a box. You know, back in the day, it was either or butcher fam or whatever, you know. And here I was like in the middle saying, I am neither just a woman that loves women. <laughs> no. So uh, coming from that to this time to the future, I think our future is very, very bright. I think that um, hopefully people take from the film to realize that human, that we are human, dialogue is important, communication is even better. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you especially to our panelists, Patrick Salmon, Bennett Singer, and Reverend Kennedy. Um, you all oh, should- Oh, you know, one more little thing can I throw in there? Um, a lot of times people ask about the crown. I received this crown, if you can see back there on the wall, there's a, a flag, it says Stonewall 25. So I received the crown at Stonewall 25. And then at Stonewall 50 from World Pride Organization, I, I, I received this uh, banner that I'm wearing. And so all oh, the whole month of uh, June, Gay Pride Month, I wear this. I don't wear the crown unless we're going out someplace, you know, I'm speaking someplace. But uh, the whole month of June, I wear this. And uh, the fact that I always tell everybody, I am the gayest great-great-grandmother out of the closet. And uh, quickly, yesterday, um, no, Sunday, I spent uh, a little time with my great-great-grandson, TJ. And so he asked me again, he said, great-great-granny, you sure you don't want to, you sure you don't want to meet my teacher? She's gay. And I'm telling him, uh, TJ, don't try to hook me up. Uh, great-granny is happy being single. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> yes. And what a, what, a, what a perfect way to end, but, you know, just having a gay teacher was mm -hmm. unimaginable in my yes. youth and in your youth. And yes, not... indeed. Yes. So uh -huh. I, I, I think that's a great note to end on. I just want to say, Melissa, thank you for guiding this discussion and for everybody for being so welcoming as we overcame our own <laughs> uh -huh. with the technology, but we did overcome it. And I think it would ended up being such a rich and, and uplifting, speaking for myself anyway, discussions. <laughs> Very happy to have been connected with you and um, appreciate all the time and effort that went into producing and making this happen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And you'll get the link tomorrow, right? For the for the full film for folks to watch. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, thank you everyone. Um, as uh, Patrick said, uh, you'll be getting an email with the link for the full uh, film. So be on the lookout for that and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>